and uh, I introduce the first speaker, Caroline. So if you want to share your screen while I do the one line introduction of your... Uh... Sure. Perfect. Let me say a few words before you start, I'm just making sure that it looks uh, that the screen looks good. I think it looks good. Okay. Uh, by the way, I see a lot of things in the chat. Uh, you guys checking the chat? I'm very excited for the talks tonight. Just to say of... hi to folks. Yeah. friends and uh, relatives. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> let's, um, without further ado, I think we are ready. Caroline Jones is professor of art history and director of the Transmedia Storytelling Initiative at MIT. Um, she has recently curated Symbionts, Contemporary Artists and the Biosphere. Um, she has published books, notably the Global uh, Work of Art, uh, I think uh, came out uh, uh, six, seven years ago. And she has also created films and exhibitions. And again, if you go to lasertalks.com, uh, you can find a longer bio and the link to her uh, her website. Uh, that's my short introduction. I don't want to take any more time. Caroline, it's all yours. I asked the other speakers to kill their video, not because I don't want to see you, but just to make sure that the uh, you know bandwidth issues don't interfere. So I'll disappear, but I'm still here and I'll mute myself, of course. Caroline, all yours. Thank you. Um, I put on my stopwatch because I don't have a written script. I just have some slides and things that I want to say about them. So thanks for the invitation. I have a lot of affection for laser in its worldwide forms, and I've had fun watching various uh, lasers that uh, Piero has offered to us. So I fell for the bait and decided I would bring to you some thoughts about Impressionism and technological shock. I am not certified to talk about Impressionism, but I teach it to MIT undergraduates, and I think it's a fascinating moment. So a lot of these ideas come out of a recent work that I've done with collaborators Huma Gupta and artist Matthew Ritchie, and we've done a paper on visual artists, technological shock, and generative AI. We found the concept of technological shock really helpful to puncture the apocalyptic claims about how we've never been in this position before, et cetera, et cetera. So the speculations about impressionism are about photography and the technological shock presented by that massively new medium in the middle of the 19th century. Yeah. So I'm showing you here the familiar chestnuts for anyone who has worked on the history of photography. The top two photographs are the first images to be fixed on a substrate. Uh, the one on the left is a reproduction that Nieps called a heliograph of a Flemish engraving. And the work on the right, on the top from 1826, the next year, is the much more famous scene outside his window over the rooftops. And for some reason, this photograph in the Gernsheim collection in Texas has been the fetish uh, for the first photograph, but it's not. So that's interesting. And, and maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A. On the bottom, of course, is Henry Fox Talbot. So like many, many technological innovations, Photography had many authors, had many people working in simultaneous countries and times and places to fix the image from a camera lucid up. So I want tonight to talk about this paradox of this technological assault and why it might be instructive to think about it in terms of what how the impressionists metabolized that techno shock in the decades that followed the invention of photography. Um, so I'm going to privilege a couple of artists looking at how they worked with this. They're marvelous stories of parlor games where Delacroix passes around photographs and has his dinner party guests opine about whether they're better than the engravings and so on and so forth. So they were seen, photographs were seen preliminarily as reproductive and as applicable to art by the art community. They wanted to know if the photograph could be a cheap way to reproduce their own artworks. 
So it's highly significant that the actual first image that was fixed on a piece of paper through photographic means was the reproduction of an engraving. Okay, so we're gonna make a romp through these decades and roughly five decades after Niepce's 1825 photograph, we have the first exhibition that will be identified as the Impressionist exhibition because of Manet's canvas called Impression, Sunrise, right? In the photographer's studio, Nadar. So I don't think any of this is coincidental and I think it's much more significant than most art historians have credited. So what were the perceived potentials of photography? Was it then a new kind of reproduction for artworks? That was Niepce's first move. Would the photograph replace the model and allow a holding of the pose forever? Would photographic interiors be amenable to photography with a new kind of lighting? Remember that this was before artificial lighting in household interiors. Would photographic negatives make possible an infinite series of replicable images? And finally, what was the significance of photography as an index of reality? What Delacroix described as a quote, completely exact rendering, unquote, of what were seen by artists to be meaningless details. So these are all the potentials that will be worked out by impressionism in one way or another in my, in my romp through this history. Okay, so the artists that I'm gonna focus on in this brief presentation are Manet and later Degas and Monet, each of whom responded very differently to the challenge of this technological medium. So I'm showing you a famous image of Monet, of Monet as king of the Impressionists, right? So even though we may not always think of Monet as an Impressionist, it was only at the end of his career that he turned to this painterly brushy style. He was seen as the leader of this young group of artists, and it was incredibly significant what he would do with this technological medium. So the first thing to know, and here I credit absolutely the scholarship of Beatrice Farwell, who was at the University of California at Santa Barbara when she began to publish her dissertation work on Manet's work with the photograph. I wanna make absolutely clear that every one of the artists in Paris in the 19th century was using the photograph. These albums of photographs depicted in Farwell's argument, the painter, Victorine Meuron, who found posing for the photographer a cheap way to earn her own keep um, in a sexist art world. So in particular, I wanna highlight for you this bottom right image, which is from the Delacroix album of these photographs, okay? So everybody was using these for holding the pose. Manet hired his own photographer to take a picture of his work. This is at the railway. And we don't from 1871, the painting is from 1871. We don't know when this photograph was made, but he was trying to figure out if he could paint on top of the photograph. And maybe this would be, you know, an adjunct to his incredible production of etchings and lithography. Maybe this would be yet another medium of reproduction for his work of art. Much more significant though, in my mind, and what I love to teach is this painting, The Dead Christ, which is at the New York Metropolitan Museum. To me, there's just no doubt, this painting led me to be Farwell's uh, scholarship because just looking at it, it's, it's shocking. So Manet confronts and masters the technological shock of photographic interior arc lighting, right? And on the left, I'm showing you just a little Bridgman stock image um, from the 19th century showing the photography assistant manipulating this enormous burning magnesium thing to illuminate the sitter on an interior to make a photograph on very slow emulsion, right? So a detail like this to me just makes it obvious that Manet is dealing with a completely unprecedented source of lighting from the position of the viewer. So the viewer is in the position of the photographer manipulating the arc lighting and 
you know, we presume that he's working with a photograph he made of a model standing in for the dead Christ and then refusing to, you know, soften these extremely harsh, almost pitiless forms of lighting on the deadness of this dead Christ body. So the way of making a modern painting of this ancient religious subject is to use this shocking form of frontal lighting from a chemical source. Uh, and just to remind you of this close up, the angel is painted completely conventionally and the Christ is given this absolute vulnerability to the machinic light uh, from the, the arc lighting. Now, of course, the same argument holds for the famous Olympia. And I'm even struck by a question, a scholarly question of whether I mean, there are photographs that show African skin, but it's it's kind of a famous trope in portrait photography that African skin is not, uh, that emulsions were not designed to capture African skin. So it's kind of intriguing that Olympia is in this washed out flash frontal lighting and uh, the African maid whose name was Laure, the model was Laure from the, um, from the Caribbean is not illuminated. Okay, so moving right along. Something like the balcony doesn't seem to have this frontal lighting. We're no longer talking about that specific moment of techno shock. But I wanna point out that in Zola's homage to Manet's um, on the balcony, you know, his, his friend, the realist novelist Zola, it points out what Manet has done, which is use the concept of depth of field uh, from the photographic apparatus to psychological end, right? Fanny Klaus, who's in the background, is fuzzy, kind of out of focus as she's getting on her gloves to go outside. She's already leaving, right? She's already in another plane. Whereas Berthe Morisseau is shown in crisp focus with her, you know, specific piercing psychological gaze. So Mane like those who followed him, were intrigued by manipulating these technical details of the photographic, the shocking, strange, mechanical photographic for psychological ends. Degas was a super important follower of Manet. So again, the available of soft pornographic photography was for Degas simply an excuse to work with his own idea of the series and to work with his own manipulation of focus and color, right? To confront what the photograph could still not do. So the argument about Degas is vaguer than the argument about Manet. We see Degas over and over again producing these series, particularly with the washerwomen, to confront absolutely and completely the same kind of image but with different kinds of colors, different kinds of lighting, more backlighting, more silhouette, less silhouette, right? So he's just sort of in a virtuosic way, producing a riposte to the photographic, um, very different from Manet, but obsessively interrogating the series, which is something that photographs were beginning to be able to do very, very well. Nadar is of course, coming into the story at around this time when Degas is making his series because Nadar was the most famous producer of photographic series of any of them. And he was personally devoted to making these artists famous. And, you know, humorously, he's photographing himself in the Montgolfier hot air balloon in a studio prop setup uh, because this was his call to fame was taking these aerial photographs of Paris. So I think it's highly significant that the Impressionists held their exhibition in Nadar's studio on Boulevard de Capuchine, as if to bring their answer to photography, their alternative to photography, their incorporation of the shocking technological effects of photography directly to its source. Um, so, I, you know, I haven't read all the scholarship. Maybe a big deal has been made out of this, but I think it's significant. When I teach my undergraduates, I always point out uh, this rather salient effect. And of course, being anti-academic, the Impressionists 
did make common cause with the photographer Nadar because they too wanted to be as modern as he was. Okay, so what kind of things were being shown at the first salon of photography in 1959? This was a salon that was pushed for by Daguerre, who of course had the patent in the Daguerre method uh, given to him by the French state. And we can imagine that something like Gustave Le Gray's effective son in Normandy, 1856, could possibly have been shown at that photographic salon. Now, given the limitations of the technology at the time in 1856, Le Gray had to take this photograph in two different exposures to capture the clouds on the same plate as he caught the ocean required a lot of technological prestidigitation. Isn't it interesting to think about the fact that he titles this effect of sun, right? And the effect of sun is happening on the photographic negative plate. 20 years later, impressionist is going to be named, the impressionist movement is going to be named from Monet's painting, Impression Sunrise. So the question is, where is the impression happening? Where is the agency? For Le Gray, the effect of sun is making its impression on the photographic emulsion. Monet is coming along and saying, the impression, c'est moi. The impression is finding its sensitive surface in my own temperament. And of course, it was Zola who said, painting is reality seen through a temperament. Okay. So the artist's very body is being configured as a kind of flesh camera, as something that will receive impressions from light and will render those impressions on the canvas in a quasi-photographic manner. I mean, I think this is at least an intriguing possibility. For his colleagues, of course, coming after him, subsequent generations call Monet an eye, only an eye, but what an eye, right? So that idea of the artist has become an ocular apparatus is I think quite intriguing. Now, Monet will follow up this 1872 impression with an obsession in the decades that follow an obsession with series. These two are on view right now at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, which locals like to joke, you know, how do you spell money? M-O-N-E-T. So Monet is on view in, with these series. And, you know, we know these, uh, the series of Rouen Cathedral from 1895 or so, 92, 93. And again, the obsession of the artist to be this kind of registration device, to have photon come in, brushstroke go out, photon come in, brushstroke go out. It's quite obsessive, right? And the devotion to staying in this one place, this fixed ocular view that will change because the painting has to be a clock. The painting also has to be a registration device for these changes in the phenomena. The series of the Waterloo Bridge, which happened at the very beginning of the 20th century, is intriguing to me for other reasons because they are climate tourism. He goes to London for the killer fogs. He goes to London for the Waterloo Bridge in these crepuscular industrial smogs. The word smog is invented at this time, right? So the Impressionists are also mystifiers of mist which has led me to some other speculations about that. We love these paintings. And in the 20th century, Monet would make them cinematic, immersive, vast, right? And photography, of course, could achieve nothing of these kinds of scales that we see in 1916 with the nymphas, the paintings of the water lilies. And remember that Monet had himself produced the pro-filmic event, as it were, uh, by planting these exotic Japanese water lilies in his Japanese garden at Giverny. So given to the state of France, following World War I, the Great War, these were configured by the state and by Monet himself 
as the ultimate healing gesture against the most technological war that had ever been fought. And they do have that effect on viewers then and now, right? The atmosphere of peace produced in the presence of these vast immersive paintings. So by way of conclusion, I just wanna to hop to an almost simultaneous moment in a different country in Germany where the techno shock of photography is processed in a very different way by entering the photograph itself and producing cut up versions of reality that would be collage, that would be montage, that would be the kind of technological derive of the photograph itself. And that's it. I think I actually did it on time. So that's 20 minutes mm, and yeah. I'll stop the share. Very, very good. Very, very good. Thank you very much. I'm really glad I invited you to give this little talk. Um, of course, I should have said at the beginning that it's, this is the 150th anniversary of the birth of the Impressionism. And there's a lot of uh, events uh, celebrating Impressionism. And I wanted to have uh, uh, you, somebody with a different, to give us a different angle about Impressionism. Uh, okay, if anybody has questions, please post them in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, I have lots of questions. Um, of course, time is limited, but let's start with the uh, science. You you covered <clears throat> you covered the the technological aspect there, uh, the impact that technology had. Um, <clears throat> as a scientist, if I think of the eighteen seventies, um, those are the age of electromagnetism and of thermodynamics, right? I think Maxwell's. Uh, Maxwell's laws are 1870, maybe two, three years earlier. Uh, Boltzmann work on entropy is one or two years later, maybe. So the, this is two questions. Uh, the, the first part is, do you know if these painters were aware of what was going on in science and if that had any impact? Uh, I'm sure they didn't know the formulas, but just, you know, the mindset. So the classic, yeah, the classic conflict, Piero, is between Bergson and Einstein, which will come. And the 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 position of Bergson as a philosopher of time is unassailed until Einstein shows up, right? And Poincaré, Condorcet, right? Positivism. I mean, these are the French geniuses that have influenced these artists of Paris, right? They're oh. not following German physics and British physics and electromagnetism, right? So, yeah. so Bergson, question... Bergson is crucial for thinking about Impressionism because he is a philosopher of time. And by the way, his philosophies of time are formed in an image of Impressionism. I mean, he's he's involved in thinking about the body and questions of durée, long durée, and rejecting the mechanism of the arbitrary second and the arbitrary measurement of time. He wants it to be experiential. So uh, that would be my, that would be where I would look for scientific impact. Of course, somewhere downstairs is my partner who's a physicist, I should go and ask him. Um, he's actually written a book on Poincaré and Einstein. So mm -hmm. uh, Poincaré would be the most important French scientist of that moment. And Bergson would be the most important philosopher of science of that moment. And Bergson was French, right? And Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, good. Both Henri's, mm -hmm. as I think about it. Excellent. Henri Poincaré. Henri yeah, Bergson. I was thinking more of the impact on quantum mechanics, actually, because uh, impression is really changed the way we look at space, not so much at time, right? Oh, but that's terms, fascinating. Yeah, but in terms so of- So should we think of the Impressionist canvases of Monet as the split screen experiment, as the split, <laughs> as the quantum split well, It's definitely experiment. a reflection. It's a, so as a scientist, I see it as a reflection on, on what is matter, you know? Mm. And before electromagnetism and before and that eventually led to quantum mechanics, uh, matter was just a yeah. solid thing. And then, you know, we start thinking in terms of uh, atoms and uh, atoms and uh, waves and, you know, 
so it becomes a different idea or matter. So I was wondering if one had an impact on the other. I think Linda Henderson would, we need to get her on the Zoom. Okay. Linda, Linda has published extensively, uh, mostly debunking arguments that relativity had anything to do with cubism, right? Mostly she wants us to understand what debates were over the fourth dimension and ideas about the ether, right? And the architect Claude Bragdon, you know, publishing spheres and cubes falling through space and intersecting with a, with a plane, right? So Linda Henderson is the authority here on what someone like Duchamp later in the 20th century would be exposed to by way of scientific ideas. Excellent. Mark so Antliff has written a little bit about Bergson and the Impressionist period. Uh, but to my knowledge, there isn't a whole lot. So maybe you should do it, Piero. Um, okay, Meredith. Uh, are you there, Meredith? Uh, yes, I am. I am here. Okay. Yeah, why don't you reveal yourself? Ah. <laughs> Happy. Um, Hello. So you, you, you I invited see you put something me, in the chat. Yeah, you invited me kindly to come back to the generative AI business. Um, we just had so much fun thinking of these epochs of technological shock. So the first one that we indulged in was Jonathan Swift in the 18th century, publishes an illustration in the Gulliver's Travel fiction of the engine which is a machine for generating literature. It's surrounded by students and they have to turn the little cranks and, and they will flip the device around and they will um, you know, churn out meaningless literature that no one wants to read. Uh, so this was a response to the techno shock of the printing press, which in England at the time was under a monopoly control given by the crown. So an author like Jonathan Swift had no control over his work. It could be printed willy nilly by these, by these station, the stationers guild. They could change anything they wanted, but mostly they would just plagiarize things and make money off of other people's work. So it took maybe 50 years after Swift's biting satires, um, and after many, many authors wrote, you know, heartfelt, you know, texts and screeds to parliament for there to be a copyright law that would tame the printing press and distribute its capacities to authors themselves. So that is a cautionary tale for thinking about techno shock. And in the paper, we also talk about early adopters of new technologies. So for us, it's very significant that one of the first people who told us what photography was good for was Frederick Douglass, the most photographed American in the 19th century. So Douglass saw photography as an, he was an early adopter who saw this technology as a, a powerful force for abolitionism. The more you could depict African-Americans in their dignity, in their finest clothes, in their powerful faces, experienced of slavery like Harriet Tubman, right? The, the more you would, his, his wonderful talk is called Pictures in Progress, right? So that is a very different metabolization of techno shock. It's an early adopter making culture around what this is good for. This is good for democracy. This is good for reformation. This is good, you know, for abolition. So those are just two examples that we write about. And our, our plea is for humanists to get inside the training sets um, to question the bias that's baked in to those training sets, to open them out to alternatives alternative metadata. There's a lot of missing metadata. Um, and sadly, if you go to Mid Journey and put in Orientalism, 
you get your very own Orientalist canvas from, you know, Jerome. You don't get a picture of the Orient that is in some sense real. You get sedimented bias from colonial archives. Okay, excellent. Uh, I, I have many more questions. I'll ask just one more. Do you, and again, I'm not an art critic, I'm not an art historian, so I, I don't use uh, proper language, but do you think that impressionism increased the distance between the artwork and the viewer? Um, this is something that came while you were talking, about. I don't remember exactly one point. Um, before impressionism, a flower was a flower. Uh, uh, an apple was an apple, so you could feel almost like touching it. And with impressionism, uh, it's, it becomes more, it's a transition toward abstract um, uh, art. And uh, the water lilies of Monet, or even the dancers of Degas, the boulevards of Pizarro, they don't feel as real. I don't feel like walking those boulevards. I don't feel like dancing with those dancers. I, I don't feel like touching those water lilies. They have this dreamy quality, right? So I don't know if I'm using the right words, but do you think it? Well, so I thought at first you meant literal distance. You know, the old canard that you have to move to the right distance from a Sahara. That too. That you, know, too. you have to move to exactly the right distance which will become Barnett Newman saying that people actually have to stand 18 inches from the canvas, I mean, like, you know, a, a precise prescription. Um, I, yes, what you say is true, but of course a lily wasn't just a lily. The whole medieval period, a lily was a portal into a divine symbol system that we were hardly privy to. We were just, had feet of clay walking around on this, this planet that God had made, you know, or this flat earth that God had made, right? And the lily, there was always an ideal, ideal lily somewhere that was divine. And that was the iconography of Mary and the miracle of the Immaculate Conception. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, no, your image of what looked like reality is profoundly photographic actually, you're a modernist. I mean, you're a modern, you know, so you probably don't have the experience of looking at a medieval canvas or, a, or an early, you know, Northern Renaissance canvas and being, oh my God, I, I'm, I'm seeing mere signs of like echoes of the divine that have briefly alighted on this surface, right? That bird in the upper corner is actually the Holy Spirit, you know, that, right? So, so my first move would be to make a little bit stranger the history of representational art, right? That it has many, many epics that are not about the real world, right? They're about some sort of grasp at the divine. But yes, I do want to give you this idea that Impressionism begins to derange that representational convention for sure. And it wants to leave us with the question of the perceiving subject. And that's a great segue for cubism. The perceiving subject, these alternate views, these multiple views that are somehow depositing themselves from the fourth dimension on this surface that is a canvas. I mean, you know, there's some wonderful ideas that come out of that. And I just taught cubism today. So, you know, I wanted them to care. It's not about Picasso. Well, you can cancel Picasso, but you can't cancel cubism. You got to figure that out because it, it's so powerful in 20th century art. Um, if you like Pietro, I can recommend a crazy, wonderful book by my colleague, Jay Kaiser, who looks at early 20th century abstraction and argues that we're seeing a cognitive revolution and that those art forms are indicative of a complete change in the capacity of, you know, this'll, this'll be the kickoff for Amy, you know, plasticity of the human brain changes the wiring of the mind to think about the fourth dimension in a painting. You know, I mean, I still have a little trouble with that. I heard Kip Thorne's talk the other day. I mean, I still have a little trouble with dimensions moving past the third. Um, but, you know, that that is an argument that 
people who love science can make, um, that this art witnesses a very profound human invention of a new way to think. Excellent. This is the idea you also offer the perfect segue to Amy's uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Caroline. And I know you have to go, so don't feel that you have to stay uh, for us. Thank you very much.